we were Bucknell's first team to play, compete internationally. Took the golf team to Scotland in 1973. And I, I mentioned about the, how money has changed, but very briefly, we had two trustees, Cam Rutledge and Bob Cooley, who paid for the trip. But we flew from Kennedy to Prestwick, buses down to St. Andrews, six nights and six breakfasts and dinners at the Old Course Hotel, five rounds of golf at the Old Course and at Carnoustie, and a flight back to New York and all of that was for $395 a person. Uh, that's about a $9,000 to $10,000 trip today. And with seven players, the coach went free. Then Now Forever Ray explores a wide array of topics surrounding bison athletics and the lives of Bucknellians near and far. With live interviews hosted by members of the Bucknell Athletic Department, Then Now Forever Ray highlights the university's proud tradition of excellence in the classroom, in the competitive arena, and in life after graduation. Welcome to another episode of Then Now Forever, Ray Bucknell. We've got a great guest with us here today, Brad Tufts, uh, somebody probably that everybody that's been associated with Bucknell or is associated with Bucknell knows his name. Brad's been um, somebody that's been tight with Bucknell since he arrived. Uh, he worked for over three decades uh, for the university, specifically in athletics for that time, covered a lot of different jobs. We're so honored to have him here with us today. A Hall of Famer. He was inducted into Bucknell's Hall of Fame in 2000. Brad, welcome to our edition today. Thanks, Todd. I uh, really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's fun. It's my first podcast. Uh, but, you know, when, even if you're 85, you can learn something new every day. There we go. So I want to start with um, your story. How did you arrive at Bucknell how did that become a place that you would spend a large uh, a chunk of your life and, and your, really your whole working uh, life? Uh, it became a, my, my sole uh, employer, so to speak, uh, for 41 years because of the people that were there and loved it. And I just loved it so much it became stronger every year. When I uh, first started working, I thought I might be there two, three, four years. I was a student assistant in the sports information office at Colgate. Um, I should have the week before finals or the week before graduation, because I only I finished my finals on the second day. I should have been down at the shore, but I wasn't because I had a term paper for a history course that I had to turn in to graduate. So I worked on a little bit day by day and uh, finally uh, in the, Wednesday before graduation on a Monday, I got a phone call from my boss, the sports information director at Colgate, Waltz Plain at the time, uh, saying he'd gotten a call from Trenny Isley, who was the director of public relations at Bucknell. Sports information was a part of the uh, public relations office at the time. And they, she had asked him if he knew anybody that he would recommend for their opening. And uh, he said, yes, I I have someone. So he called me at a fraternity house and gave me her number. And I called her back and I set up a interview for the day after graduation. Um, I went down. That was a Monday. Would have been Monday, June 8th graduation was and drove to Philadelphia that night and took a train to, to Harrisburg and then up to Milton. And she met me there. You don't do anything like that anymore. Um, and I uh, had the interview there and was about, I think it was maybe eight or nine days later, maybe a week, uh, got offered the job and accepted it. And on June 29th, 1959, I started working at Bucknell. And it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was a different place. It was great. I was, I was, uh, Arlie Shart, who had been the SID before he'd done the football media guy. So I didn't have to start that from scratch, although it's a little different from what's done today, but I just, uh, started going through the files and reading everything I could, uh, uh, the list of football records was one page, maybe three quarters of a page in the meet in a uh, 
five by eight media guide and that was it. So right then I started com reading things, compiling records and did that for other sports going on. And uh, it, I don't know, it's just something that really grew on me. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, when uh, my late wife Betty arrived as an assistant dean of women in the summer of 1964, we started dating uh, midway through that fall um, and um, married two years later and uh, two girls grew up there. It's just, uh, it, it was, it was something, a lot of different things. I think I was there because they did so many different things over the time. Uh, uh, sports information, I left it in, uh, after five years and went to the, uh, became assistant director of public relations doing uh, publicity for everything else except for sports uh, on campus. And then um, in 1980, um, Bruce Corey was the athletic director and he arranged to have sports information moved to the athletic department. So I went back doing that and set up a whole new office and moved files and created new ones and, um, and then was with the athletic department for 20 years there before retiring. You know, for the general fan who doesn't know anything about or know even know what is a sports information director or in these days, athletic communications, um, talk about what exactly that profession is. Obviously, you and I know that well, yeah. um, but it's really, in my opinion, one of the most underappreciated parts of college athletics. Uh, it, you work a lot of hours and, you know, Betty was awesome. I still remember her. she used to bring us lunch all the time in the office. Yeah. Um, but you're there a lot and people don't know that. It's not just going to the games. It's not just doing the stats at a game. It, it's so much more than that. And now today it's evolved even to, into a whole different thing entirely. Yeah, it's it's I don't even know everything that's uh, they're doing today. It's so much so much electronic uh, and I think maybe less personal. They're the one-on-one -on -one communication. When I, uh, my first five years at Bucknell and and then the 10 years from 1980 to 1990, uh, covering the time when you were in school, um, we mailed out things to newspapers, uh, news releases, uh, sent things to hometown papers of the athletes. Uh, it was much more print and maybe record audio rather than video. Um, those early years, it, it involved, uh, I didn't have to solicit the ads, but everything else for the football programs and getting them printed for five, four or five home games, getting the pictures for them. Uh, today, any editors, if they have a picture, they can print it five different ways in uh, five different publications using the same picture by different sizes and, and screening, whatever they did. In those days, we got a, a plate made of a picture and it was expensive. We had to see. And if you made that expense, you want to use that picture the same size in f all future publications. But, but it, it meant it was uh, communicating with the media and, and reporting uh, all of the events is before laptops. They're all done over phone calls. If you had um, five newspapers or five media outlets to report a score to, you had made five different phone calls. There weren't laptops to write the story and and you know blast it out to all five of them at once. And you also couldn't do it on the bus coming home or in the car coming home when someone else is driving. You had to do it on site. Um, uh, and there weren't I cell phones. It, it was the, a uh, different world. I remember, Brad, at the football games, the uh, the old mimeograph machine with the purple ink. Yes. You run that through. And I mean, that's after you're, you know, you're type, you're typing a play by play on a typewriter. So right. you have to make sure you have correction tape and all that good old stuff. So it's a different world now than it was then. And I think a lot of what it has morphed into is, you know, sports information, and athletic communications is largely a recruiting tool. Um, and it's a, it's the way that the prospective student athletes view the university and the programs uh, this day and age. And that's that's how important it's become in that avenue. Yep, it's uh you mentioned Betty used to type it for some years. She typed the play by play of the football games. We'd have, the student would be sitting next to her telling her who the ball carrier was 
and how many yards so she could just continue, you know, just looking at the typewriter and, and didn't see a whole lot of the game, but uh, didn't miss much. And basketball was the same way she did some basketball games. And, uh, and you had two people keeping statistics. And, uh, you know, you saw today and you put input the statistics or what's going on in a basketball game and you get a play by play printed out and detailed statistics and uh, because of the computer program. But um, now I can remember there would be times when uh, uh, we'd have late stories uh, break and I'd, I'd uh, type up a couple of copies of the story and many, many times hopped in the car and drove down to Sunbury and gave one to the Sunbury Daily Item because that was, if you had such story uh, you wanted them to print the next day, you might call them and tell them what's coming and, and you take it down there. Um, not, nothing, no electronic transmissions. It's like so much of, of our life today. It's, it was different, but it, it was, to get back to your first question, it's trying to tell the, the world, uh, sometimes a very small world, just the campus, uh, sometimes more, a little bigger, the local area, and sometimes much wider. Tell them what's going on in athletics at Bucknell. Um, and it, it, it's if you could all this, if you get someday a story that made the national media, that that would be uh, that that was great. Well, you had quite the career in sports information, and you know you've been recognized many times over for what you've done, especially in the Northeast here. Uh, ECAC SIDA and, and those things of those of that nature. And you've mentored so many people in that field. Uh, what are some of the things while you were here that, that you really took pride in doing? Like I, for example, I know the faces in the crowd was something that you were, you were, you did a really good job with. Talk about some of those things. Well, that was the faces in the crowd, which sports illustrated, which used to appear weekly now appears monthly. Um, they, do two pages now, but they only feature usually like three people uh, in the whole thing. It used to be uh, one page and there'd be like, I think it was six, um, five, six, seven different athletes, uh, high school, uh, college, people way beyond college. And you'd try, if you had an outstanding athlete or an outstanding achievement, you'd get on the phone, call Sports Illustrated and tell them what you've got and try to sell them on it. And they might say, no, we're not interested. They might say, okay, get that to us. Uh, and sometimes usually wouldn't, ha you could mail it to them or you could give it to somebody over the phone and then mail them a picture. They get, I remember the very first, Button else had quite a string and people after me got uh, faces in the crowd. The, our very first one was Paul Terry's, God rest him. Uh, he was the quarterback on the Lambert Cup team, the first Lambert Cup team in 1961 of Bucknell's all-time great athletes ever. Uh, he, he was really good. Um, and then he played uh, for the small college team in, in a, all of, it was called a college All-American game in December of 1960, his senior season. And I got him in uh, faces in the crowd after that. And then a really interesting one that uh, turned out to be, it was a tragedy later. Uh, one of the, I got a face in the crowd when I was working public relations and it was Matt Ridgway. He was the son, uh, Matt Ridgway Jr. was the son of General Matt, Matthew Ridgway, who was the uh, commander of the U.S. forces, the Allied forces in the Korean War. And Matt Ridgway was, came to Bucknell and he won an Eastern Intercollegiate Rifle Championship. And I figured people knew General Ridgway uh, as, um, you know, Ar Rifle Army. And I figured if his son, Matt Ridgway Jr. won this, I, it would be a natural for faces in the crowd. And it was. And then very sadly, the general was the speaker at the ROTC commissioning ceremony that year, oh, 1969, maybe, I'm not sure. And uh, Matt was uh, an ROTC graduate. And that summer, he was, they were, uh, they were taking canoes off a train 
to trucks to go to a camp way up in Canada, and he was hit in a trail yard, the train yard, killed young Matt Ridge. Jet had just only two months, a month graduated from Bucknell. Um, but um, but that was, it was calling us, and we, and we had great string, and uh, actually we had somebody in Faces in the Crowd twice, which I, uh, Sports Illustrated, usually would prevent. Art Goulden was in there twice. Uh, and one time I remember he, he had, um, in the 80s, three distance runners that were really outstanding and was hard to divide. They'd been, and I talked SI into running one, one entry with all three of them. Uh, I don't know if I, they did a couple of those with multiple people, but that was one of the things. Uh, and academic All-Americans promoting I'm them. I'm going to go there next. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, uh, it's, it, we began with the college division. Uh, they had a college division and a university division, academic All-Americans. And they began with just football, basketball, and baseball. This is before there were women's sports. And our first Butnell's first academic All-American was one Dave Woolheater got in. Uh, his name was Dave Hill, and he was a baseball player, I believe, first baseman on the baseball team. Uh, but then we had a, you know, a lot of them afterwards. It, it's so competitive now. Uh, uh, but they now there are they have them in almost every sport. Uh, there's a few at large for a little small, but we've had a a, a really great list of them in it. I was ho I'm hoping sometime that we could, uh, is, uh, there is, we had that great uh, um, list, uh, the wall at the end of, uh, on the south end, uh, in, the, in the hallway uh, outside the south end of uh, uh, Kenny Natatorium, listing all of our academic All-Americans. We do, and it's and, really impressive. Uh, it's one of the things at Bucknell that we like to hang our hat on, you know, successful in the scholar-athlete model. And to have as many academic all Americans as we do for an institution our size is is quite remarkable, actually. And I want to also take a turn, though, now, Brad, and uh, go away from the sports information. Uh, aside from that, you were doing other things at Bucknell over the years. In fact, at one point, you were the interim athletic director. Um, but let's talk about something that you had a love for, and that's coaching. Um, talk about coaching the men's golf program, and then let's morph into how you began the women's golf program. Okay. Um, I, Harold Evans, who was the, uh, all but the first year, he, he was the head golf pro at Bucknell Golf Club from 1931 until, uh, I forget when he retired in the 1960s, but he had been the head coach of Bucknell's golf team. And he he didn't have any assistance in the shop. And whenever uh, there were matches, he had his wife had to take care of the shop, and he just decided he didn't want to do that anymore. So it was just a part time job. And I um, I was asked to, to coach. I was working in the public relations office, and um, I was asked to take the job. Uh, it, uh, it I won't mention the salary at the time, of course money, the salaries of those days don't mean anything today, but, um, the, it, it was, I said, yes. And I, but I got, to, uh, Trini Isley, who was still director of public relations then it was okay with her, which is great because she knew I'd be, um, uh, at the time, but now all, all we played was some dual matches, uh, in the, in the spring and the middle Atlantic conference championship. That was it. And that was a one day tournament in those days. Uh, I, my very first year, I got us in a couple fall tournaments and expanded the, the schedule. And and then in my second year coaching, took the team on a spring uh, vacation, uh, spring break trip, which meant being out of the office for a week. So I worked a lot of nights when I came back making up for that. But it was I it was really special and uh, got to know guys, uh, several of whom, a uh, number of whom I still stay in touch with. Uh, we took um, we we took Bucknell's first team international. We, we were Bucknell's first team to play compete internationally. Took the golf team to S Scotland in 1973, and I I, met, I mentioned about the, how money has changed. But very briefly, we had two 
trustees, Cam Rutledge and Bob Cooley, who paid for the trip. But we flew from Kennedy to Prestwick, buses down to St. Andrews, six nights and six breakfasts and dinners at the Old Course Hotel, five rounds of golf at the Old Course and at Carnoustie, and the flight back to New York and all of that was for $395 a person. Uh, that's about a $9,000 to $10,000 trip today. And with seven players, the coach went free. And uh, Betty went over the with party. me. And, um, gee, we spent one day, one full day, uh, really had a great day away from golf there on Wednesday. Uh, no, on yeah, Wednesday of that week, um, Doug and Can Doug and Mary Canlon were in Sterling, Scotland. Doug was there in sabbatical. Uh, and they dr came down to, uh, to St. Andrews, uh, had B and B and picked us up that Wednesday morning and drove us all over the mid uh, upper Midlands and lower Highlands, the little places they'd found and enjoyed. It was just a, a really special day we had then. Um, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'd love to get back for their having a celebration of life for Doug, uh, in September or, I believe in September or end of August. I, you know, like Brad, to I, back. I don't know if I'll be able to conversation. I, su I should have started the golf conversation with the experience you had that wasn't at Bucknell with a certain, as a certain caddy. Maybe you can tell that story yep. first. Uh, okay. I, uh, um, I won't, I won't, uh, I've got something hanging on the wall here that I could get in uh, every show, but the summer after my freshman year at Colgate, I had a great experience. The U.S. Open, this is 1956, and the U.S. Open was played at Oak Hill in Rochester, where they, uh, back in May, they played the uh, PGA Championship. Uh, so a lot of people saw the course had been redone some. I had a fraternity brother at Colgate whose dad was chairman of the caddy committee for the tournament. And this is the days before, and none of the players had their own caddies. They couldn't afford it. Uh, and um, and the... Uh, so they need player. You used caddies from the local club. Uh, they needed some extra ones at Oak Hill. Um, I went up there. My uncle had an uncle live there. And short of it was I caddied for Ben Hogan in the 1956 Open. Um, he he lost. They finished tied with Julius Boros, one shot behind Kerry Middlecoff. It would have been his fifth Open, and no one's ever won five. Um, for any golf fans listening to this, watching it, uh, there's a, if you haven't read it, get the book, The Match. I, I promise you, I guarantee you'll love it. Um, it's by Mark Frost, who wrote The Greatest Game Ever Played about Francis We Met's 1913 uh, U.S. Open win. And he did this one, and it uh, takes place in the end of January of 1956, the same year. Uh, that I, I caddied for Hogan four and a half months later after it. And H Hogan was part of the match. Uh, but uh, so that was, that was a special thing. Yeah. It gave you all the experience you needed, Brad, to become a golf coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, gosh, coaching, when I was coaching the men's team, I was really, I felt I was in a, not a disadvantage, but I, I couldn't exercise an advantage I had, and that is knowing the game and, and being able to help players even the middle of the round if I saw something they're doing that would be easily correctable or give advice about how to play a hole. We couldn't do any of that like they do now. I mean, most of these teams have, a lot of them have two coaches, but you can talk to your players and you can even help them line up the putts on the green as long as you don't unduly delay anything. We couldn't talk to them at all then. And so I was in the same boat as the, uh, some of the other couple other coaches who were just van drivers. Um, and uh, that's one thing that's it's really helped that it's changed. But uh, we, we would sneak in uh, a few hand signals. I would see a player know that he hit a seven iron off a of par three. And when the next guy came along, I might, uh, you know, flash seven fingers to, to show that. But uh, it, uh, but it, it was some eight and a half years when we had to, uh, we won a conference championship that first year and the number one player, my first year coaching in 1967 and the number one player in that team, Lowell Watson, uh, still playing a lot of golf up in Maine. I think, I think he shot his age the first time when he was like 65 or six 
and he's he, hundreds of times he's shot his age now. He's still playing very good golf. So but, fast forward a little bit yep. into the mid nineties. Okay. And women's golf becomes something that we're considering here at Bucknell. Um, obviously this year we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of that program. But before we get into that, tell us a story about how you started the golf program. And it wasn't an easy thing to do here. No, it, it wasn't. Uh, and I, for beginning in the early nineties, uh, I, every once in a while, a woman would come to Butnell for an admissions interview and they would ask about golf and they would be persons that that woman and her parents would be sent down to my office and I would talk to them, tell them what we had. We did, we didn't have a program that I was hoping we might have one soon. This was a day title nine days. Uh, it wasn't going to add a lot of women to the overall program, but eight or nine or 10 is, you know, was more than none. Um, and we had, there was a couple of good players. And then, uh, it was in the fall of, let's see, uh, I think 93, maybe. Uh, the spring of 93, I'd met a woman by the name of Christy Robson. I met her. I was, I was involved at the time. Uh, I had uh, been involved doing things with the Bucknellian. Um, and this was a dinner for uh, people on the Bucknellian staff. I was at it, got talking with her, and she had played a lot of good junior golf in the Philadelphia area and actually played on the Philadelphia girls team that played inner city matches with uh, Boston and New York. Short of it was the next fall, uh, I stayed in touch with Christy. It was her junior year. And um, I took Christy, another woman who was a freshman, down to a fall tournament, weekend tournament, played Friday at Princeton, Saturday at Rutgers. Christy finished 10th overall among the top players in the East. Uh, I came back, uh, talked to Rick Hartzell, the athletic director, got his okay. Well, I wrote something and had him approve it. I offered, I wanted to start a team right then. I, there was enough people uh, that I knew, and there were some other women on campus who played some golf. And um, I wrote this memo. I offered to coach the team for nothing. And we had to, we had a course you could walk, you know, walk to in five minutes. There wasn't a facility like uh, the Bachman Center now, but um, the answer I got after a, I don't know, a week later or something was, thanks anyway, thank you, but we're planning to do it within a short period of time with starting an overall um, gender equity program th throughout the university, all aspects of the university. And we don't want to add this at this time. Well, that study didn't get started for another two years. And, uh, and it, this is, you know, it's all uh, old history, but uh, it's all history now. Uh, we did get started in 1990. The Board of Trustees approved women's golf as a varsity sport uh, at their meeting in August. Uh, no, in January of 1998. The deadline for admissions had passed. Um, Betty was working in the admissions office and I told her, I said, um, whenever, tell everybody in the staff, whenever they're reading an application and the word golf is mentioned, if it, somebody that might have a chance of being accepted, send me their name and phone number uh, and I'll call them. And then I put out so a call. Betty, uh, Brad, Betty yeah. was your ace recruiter. What? Betty oh, yes, was she your was. Ace recruiter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, so then I put a call out on campus and, uh, the short of it was we, um, I got, there were two women who had applied and Bucknell, one of them had an older brother who'd come to Bucknell, uh, Bridget O'Mara and then Hillary Menka. Uh, I talked the two of them into coming and they were our number one and two players that fall in the fall of, uh, 98. Our other three players um, were uh, Heather Mann, Christine Frieda, and Chris Boshan. Now Chris Wiley. Uh, Chris had never played a Chris Wiley never played a competitive round of golf in her life. We had just five players, uh, and played our first tournament up at Dartmouth in that fall. But we we never finished last in the tournament, and uh, um, Hillary and and Bridget kept us 
you know, respectable. And it, it was uh, it was good. Then we got better each year. We had four recruits the next year. Uh, and I, I really didn't anticipate that I'd be retiring in 2000. That's another whole story why I did then. I thought it might go another couple of years, but um, uh, it, it was great getting it started and uh, uh, some interesting, some fun trips. Now, when the program started, there was not women's golf in the Patriot League, correct? No, there wasn't. No. Right. No, there wasn't. And that didn't happen till well after. We were the first Patriot League school to have a women's team, I believe. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, some of them had club teams. I, I don't think Lehigh came became varsity till a year or two after us, and same with Holy Cross. I think Holy Cross was the second one, Patriot League school to have uh, varsity women's golf. Um, but it's uh, and it's great. Now we're getting 25 years. Going to celebrate 25 years this October with the, uh, a weekend. I'm hoping that uh, a lot of the women come back. I'm sure. Uh, you know, I, I know some of them have never seen the Bachman Center and, and what it provides for the for Bucknell's varsity teams, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to to coming back. I've and to um, you know I've I've stayed in touch with uh, some of the some of the women from those first those two years I was with the team and and I got to know some others. The uh, the team played. Uh, I've I've gone up to see them play twice, maybe three times, at least twice up in uh, at Kiowa outside of Charleston. And then two different teams played in tournaments here at Hilton Head, um, in their spring break tournaments. So I've, I've gotten to know some. Uh, it was really funny. One one tournament, um, I we it was down here. Bucknell was playing uh, in the tournament and also – uh, USC, which South Carolina Upstate, uh, which is in Spartanburg, uh, was playing. And I had my early years down here, I had coached the Hilton Head High School girls golf team. Uh, two state championships in three years, but uh, two of the players, twins on that team, on both of those two uh, state champion teams, were playing for USC Upstate. And they were paired that day. I went to watch them play. They were paired with Bucknell. Uh, they and Bucknell were in the same foursomes. So it was uh, neat to watch to to meet the Bunnell women and to to see uh, these these twins, the Wedzik twins. Um, so it's uh, golf's been a, a great uh, part of my life, and being able to coach the teams, even though it was neither time was a full time job, was really great. Well, it's been exciting to watch the team develop over the years, and certainly in the middle of October here, we're, we're getting fired up for that that anniversary. And yep. as you mentioned. We hope a lot of people come back. We'll have a reception Friday uh, later in the afternoon, the early evening at the Bachman Golf Center for folks that can come in town. And then a round of golf on Saturday, um, followed by a, a lunch uh, Saturday afternoon. So it should be a great event. We hope we can get all the members of the, of the program to come back. That would be, be absolutely the, the best. We could share a lot of great stories about you and the others that have coached in the program. And Coach Laura, you know, Tyler Cook has done a good job right now with the program. Hey, going back a couple minutes of our conversation, see if this. Oh, there he is. That's. Yep. Look at you that's, holding that bag in the background. What? Yeah. I see you holding that bag in the background. <laughs> just a young kid. Yeah. We discovered no pictures taken, nothing like this taken at the time of the tournament. This, this, uh, I discovered this um, a magazine the USJ put out. Uh, Betty and I were up uh, at the open. The last time the open was at Oak Hill was in 89. And we went up for the last day of the tournament. This was in a magazine, a USGA publication. Uh, I, I found and uh, I saw it. I went crazy when I saw it. Picked up, we picked up about eight, eight or 10 copies, threw them in a bag. I went to the media center and Craig Smith, former sports information director at Lafayette, yep. uh, was the media relations director for the USGA at the time. So I got the media the media center, got him, and he saw it. He hadn't realized about the picture. And he uh, got a copy of that picture before it was sent back to it. It came out of Sports Illustrated's archives. They, they hadn't used it in the magazine. But before it was sent back, uh, he had a copy made for me. And That's great. It's something you'll treasure. You know, yeah, I have it in a, I have a big uh, shadow box here that has that picture, the c caps they issued to us. Um, 
the t the t-shirts we wore the three balls he played the last nine holes with of the tournament and an autographed scorecard uh, so but, uh, well brad you know you might be 85 but you're probably if i had to guess you are probably the you epitomize the walking encyclopedia of Bucknell athletics trivia and knowledge because you can still recall swimming times, track and field times from 30 years ago. It amazes me. And I can't tell you how much the staff here appreciates that you still look at our material and make, and you keep us on our toes, which is great because you can never have enough eyes looking at something before you put it out there representing the university. Thanks. I, I'm blessed. I'm able to do that, and I, um, I still, I, I still do uh, proofreading and a little editing of Bucknell Magazine. Uh, they send me first the class notes and the rest of the magazine uh, um, in uh, uh, email it to me, and so it's, and that it you know keeps it keeps me going. But I, uh, um, it's there's there's so much uh, in athletic communications now. Just all of the there's so many things like uh, when we're, what we're doing now, that this is my first podcast. Uh, and uh, Mike Coleman's title, I think, is um, Digital Coordinator Fan Engagement, something like that. When I, okay, or something like that. When I came to uh, Bucknell, we talk, you talked about those early years with sports information digital coordinator of fan engagement was me downtown on Friday pointing at a friend saying, I'll see you at the game tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but um, now it's, uh, I've, I, I was, a lot, a lot of things happen in, in life that makes the fact that I was single when I first came to Bucknell in those first five years or so summers, Played a lot of golf, but besides that, I had a lot of time when I could go through the archives and, and, and really build up the archives. We didn't have much, uh, the basketball records that existed, team and individual records, uh, they weren't more than one page, <laughs> maybe not even that. But did, I did a lot of research of, of records and and a lot of, when athletes that I'd read about from the teens and the 20s and 30s came back, I had a uh, fortune to meet them. Uh, Got to know Clark Hinkle uh, well, and uh, everybody, uh, all all of the people. I think almost everybody in the Hall of Fame I met, except for Christy Madsen and a couple of those guys from the eighteen uh, nineties. But I mean, the other guys uh, uh, had, had come back. Um, got to got to meet. Um, uh, I think I even met Doggy Julian one of the earlier years. But it, it was uh, it's it's been great. Well, the fact that you're still involved with the university ties in with the forever part of this podcast. And we talk about being forever attached to Bucknell and you do that still. You're, you're still a Hall of Fame uh, committee member. So you're very involved with that, which is an important entity here in our department. And we appreciate everything you do. I appreciate you in so many ways, uh, not only as the first mentor that I had in the profession and a, a quick story on that. I don't know if you remember this. But I was working in the press box and we were playing Colgate of all football teams. And it was a game where Bucknell was trailing and came back at a big qu fourth quarter comeback. And we yeah. won the game at the end of the game. And here's little Todd Newcomb in the corner of the press box cheering. And you looked at me and I'll never forget it. And you said, you can't cheer in the press box. You got to, you know, have some etiquette. And I and that's something I learned from the very beginning from you. And I've taken that with me and one of the little things you learn, you know, along the way. So Brad, I, I, I thank you for being with us today. I thank you for everything you've done for Bucknell. And we're really looking forward to seeing you here for the uh, celebration of golf in October. Todd, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's, I just love talking Bucknell athletics with people. And uh, I, um, I play with a group of guys. I play golf once a week now. That's all. And I, I bag it when it's too hot, but um, I play with these guys and all different backgrounds. And my nickname is the Bucknell Bomber. So I've, I've got, uh, but uh, the I, I try to tell people about Bucknell whenever I run to them, and it's uh, 
It's fun. I've run ahead. It's uh, created some interesting conversations. Mm -hmm.